Now, my little black book tells me that I am to give to him and to the congregation an exhortation suited to the occasion. An exhortation suited to the occasion. With that in mind, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll have a reading from two passages, despite what it says in the bulletin. From Acts chapter 6, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we may be put in charge of this task. And we will devote ourselves to prayer to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And a second passage from 1 Timothy chapter 3, take verses 8 to 13. After the first seven verses, uh, speak to us about the qualifications for elders. And then in verse 8, in 1 Timothy 3, we read, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women or wives must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife, good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Great and mighty God. We are very thankful for the occasion. And now we ask that you would adorn the occasion by giving us ears to hear, eyes to see, uh, things that you have for us in the scriptures tonight. I pray, Father, it's a, a, an out of sync sermon and an unusual sermon for me, but I pray that you would bless it, uh, not by the worthiness of the speaker or the hearers, but by your love for the church. You would bless what we do now. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. So uh, I'm to give it a, uh, some sort of exhortation appropriate to the occasion. Now I could have just preached my regular sermon and given a little tiny exhortation, but I always think on an occasion like this we ought to spend a little more time on something like this. And so naturally we think, what do you preach about deacons and the two obvious? I've just read you the the two most obvious passages uh, to preach from. And in fact, on other occasions when we have ordained deacons, I preach from both of those passages. And that's kind of my gut instinct is to take a passage and just preach that particular text. But I thought, having done that, preach both of those passages more than one time. Not that I expect any of you to remember them. I thought I'd take a, a different tact this evening. I don't, I don't want to just focus on the word deacon. I want to focus on the words behind the word. Oh, buckle up. It's going to be a little academic, at least on the front end. We're going, to, we're going to divide our consideration of this matter of deacon. We're going to divide it into two parts. Etymology. Yes, I said that. Etymology. And exhortation. If you're wondering what is etymology, ironically, etymology is the study of words. That's what that word means. <laughs> etymology and exhortation. So we'll start with etymology. The word that we're interested in this evening is the word deacon. But I want to start with an observation about not just the word deacon, but uh, uh, something that is a little bit interesting about the titles of church officers. 
uh, offices that we no longer have and offices that we still have. The office we no longer have is the office of apostle, uh, but we still have pastors and we still have elders and we still have deacons. But something that is interesting about those words, a little bit interesting, is when we hear those words, that's what we hear. We hear officer. We hear apostle and we think of Paul or John or Peter. We think of those who authored the scriptures. Uh, we think of, we hear the word pastor and that's the, the guy who does the preaching and the weddings and the funerals and visits the hospital and that sort of thing. And we hear elder and we think of the, the person or persons that help to govern the church or rule the church and lead the church. And we think of deacons as we think of deacons and secondly, but we hear those words as officers. But what is striking about those words is those are not special words. They're special words now. In our context, 2,000 years later and into a different language, they are, those are all special words to us. But at the time that they were first being employed in the church, those were just regular words that were then given a special use. For, so you take them, uh, uh, an apostle, or the Greek word apostolos, it just means one who is sent. You can translate it, and in a few places in the New Testament, it is translated simply as messenger. If you send your child next door to tell your neighbor something, hey, we have tomatoes in the garden, feel free to pick some, the child is your apostle. The apostle of the garden, gone to deliver your message, uh, uh, granting uh, access to the garden to your neighbor. They are your apostle because you sent them. That's what that word means. Uh, if, if you're a pastor, it just means you're a shepherd. That's what the word means. The, the, the Greek word is poimen. But if you're reading Luke 2 and it says there were shepherds in the field at night with their flocks, it's the same word that in Ephesians that we translate as pastor. Pastor is actually from a Latin word, but it's still in shepherd. But when you first heard that word 2,000 years ago, you, just heard, you, you thought the guy with the sheep. Uh, elder means old guy, you know, old guy. As in, uh, in 1 Timothy 5, uh, uh, Paul says to Timothy um, that he, he ought not to rebuke an older man, but should speak to him as a father. So, if you, you know, if you're if you're trying to exhort someone, a, a man is trying to uh, call an older man uh, and speak to him. He needs to speak to him by way of correction. He still needs to respect him. But the word it's the same word that we use for the office. It just means an old guy or an older person. And uh, sorry, just we'll, we'll, we're going to come to deacon in a moment. But you see, those are just words. They're just common words that then are uh, turned into special titles. But the understanding of the common word then informs the office that bears that title. So uh, while you can send anyone to bear a message for you, and in that sense, they are an apostle of you. When we say apostle, we mean those that have been sent by Christ and have a unique message, the gospel, and they have a unique authority when they speak because of the one that has sent them. Uh, when we speak of a pastor, a shepherd in the church, it is our understanding of literal shepherds and sheep and the relationship between the shepherd and the flock of sheep, that is to inform our relationship, the relationship of the pastor of the church and the congregation of the church. There ought to be some sense of the care that the pastor is supposed to show for the flock, the provision he's supposed to make for the flock. And there should be some uh, in, uh, informing to the flock of how they ought to respond to the shepherd, the broad, the common meaning of the words and form. So it is with elder. We associate, though we've all known old fools, we still associate that an older person will have a certain amount of gained wisdom and insight and is due a certain amount of natural respect. We take that understanding of our response or our, our relation to older people and then that informs what we expect of, of an elder. We expect them to have a certain gravity and a certain wisdom. 
whether they're particularly old or not, if they're in the office of elder. The broader meaning of the words informs the other, which brings us to the office of deacon. Now, if you have uh, if you have software, you know, Bible software, or if you're just diligent and you have a concordance the way many people used to do, you got out your concordance or you opened up your uh, Bible software in an English Bible and you looked for the word deacon in the English Bible, most English translations, you're going to five five verses. And I've read four of them to you tonight out of 1 Timothy 3. There's four of the five uses of the word deacon. Uh, the other one is actually in Philippians, in the very first verse of Philippians, uh, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to the saints in Philippi, in Christ Jesus, including the overseers and the deacons. So it doesn't really inform us anything about a deacon other than that they were there in Philippi. So the other four uses of the word deacon in your English Bible are all right here in 1 Timothy 3. Now, if you have uh, the ability either the old-fashioned way with the concordance or with the newfangled way uh, with computers to search not the English text, but the Greek text, and you search for the word that has been translated as deacon, which is the Greek word diakonos, for you busy, busy notators, that's D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S in English, diakonos. If you search for that word, why you don't find it five times, you find it more than 25 times. So it's plainly not always translated as deacon. You find that word 25 times. And then if you're a particularly bright uh, bulb in this area, you might know that there are what we call cognate words. What's a cognate word? Did I tell you it's going to be a little bit academic on the front? Cognate means uh, from the same origin. Um, and so a cognate word has the same root. So two words that are cognate have the same root. And you might know that there are two more words in the Greek New Testament that are cognates of diakonos. One of them is diakonia, uh, that's a noun, and the other one is diakoneo, which is a verb. So, well, this is fascinating, Pastor. Um, what, what are we doing again? Well, if you just think of those three words, if you think of them, if you were to give them very, very simple English cognate translations, then diakonos is uh, servant, and diakonia is service, what the servant does. And diakoneo is the verb serving. So the servant gives you service by serving. Those are the three cognate words. Now, if you were to search your, you've got the software, or you're really diligent with your uh, uh, Greek concordance, and you, you look for all the forms of those words, those three words, well, now you're up to about 90. About 90. I think it's 89 verses, but it's more than 89 uses because. Some of the verses have more than one use of those words in the verse. And you begin to look at these words, and, and you, you begin to see how the, what we would call the, the uh, diakon word group. This is now a word group, these three words, they all have the same root. You look how this group of words is used, that's how you begin to understand what is the idea. What's the, the idea of this word group, which will then help us understand what is the idea of this office that bears this word? Now, the root idea of the diakon word group is the, the very word idea. If you go all the way back to its true core idea is Table service. Table service. Now, for us, we live in a world of restaurants, so we're thinking waiters. You know, you're thinking Applebee's. Really? That's the idea? A waiter at a No, no, no. Uh, this, uh, the Bible wasn't written in a world of restaurants. The Bible was written in a world of slaves, servants, 
And so the idea of table service isn't, you know, the job you had in high school or college or to get by while you were working on something else. It's not, it's not that. The idea of the table servant spoke much more to your rank in the social order. It was a much more important distinction. That is, it was much more important and defining which side of that position you were on. You hear it when Jesus asks some rhetorical questions in Luke 22. Um, he says this, he asks rhetorically, who is greater? Who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? That's our verb. Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Isn't, isn't that one greater? Is it obvious? Every, this, is a, this is a, nobody is puzzled over this question. Everybody in that world knows, of course, the guy who's reclining at the table is greater. Jesus says, but I am among you as the one who serves. I am among you as a diakonos. That's who I am. He's placed himself, to the surprise of many, on the lower side of that marker that sort of divided the world between the haves and the haves nots, or the importance and the unimportant. Uh, so he, that's how he speaks, certainly to the surprise of everyone. And as Christians, that's really probably where we should start to think about this word or this word group. But then we can begin to look at how the word is used across the New Testament and what we find. Well, we, we, we find examples of the literal. We find people waiting at table. Uh, you know, um, John chapter 12, after Lazarus is resurrected from the dead, he is, uh, he and Jesus and others are reclining at the table and Martha is serving at the table. She's, she, and the, it's this word group that is described, which is, she's literally their waitress, as it were. And uh, there are other examples. We, we just, a few weeks ago, Peter's mother-in-law was raised up from her sick bed, the fever left her, and she waited upon Jesus. That's why it's translated. But it's this word group. That's what she's doing. Diakonos, or diakonia. She's giving service. So we find the literal explanations or literal uses, but then very uh, quickly from that, we, we see broader uses. Support. Sometimes the words are translated, diakonia is translated as support. And so we read of those who are supporting, like um, uh, the, the, there are a number of wealthy women that are described as supporting the ministry of Jesus. They gave support to him. It's diakonia. And when uh, Paul and others are gathering together material goods and money for the suffering saints in Jerusalem, it's, it's called support or contributions, but it's the same words. It's the agony that they're, they're carrying back. So it has a, the literal meaning of waiting at the table. It has a little broader meaning of, of supporting, helping, physical uh, care. But then as you move uh, forward into the life of the church, this word group becomes the word group of ministry. So if you think of the three words as servant, service, and serving, by the time you get into the, the ministry of, the, of the Paul's missionary journeys and his letters, those words are going to be translated far more often as uh, minister, ministry, and ministry. But it's still the same words. It's the same words. So these things are transformed. And so as you think about that, you think of the literal feeding, caring, taking care of, the supporting, the financially supporting, physically supporting. Uh, you, you, you think of the, the spiritual service of ministering. So you're not just feeding them physically, but feeding people spiritually. That's what Paul calls his ministry, his diakonia. He's giving the gospel. When you take all that meaning, and then men are set aside and they're called deacons, diaconos. All of that activity 
comes into and helps inform what we understand them to be and what they're supposed to be about. And I would, I would have you think about it this way. Deacons are to support the church in her spiritual mission. She support the church in her spiritual mission. Now I read you the two uh, passages that directly speak to us of deacons. So Acts chapter six is the inception of deacons. There's the literal speaking of table service there. And uh, 1 Timothy 3 is the passage that describes the qualifications of the office of deacon. Now, notice in both passages, there is a description of what qualifies those that would be deacon. And there's nothing practical said. It is, it is moral qualifications. It is spiritual qualifications. There's nothing in there about good with their tools um, or, or uh, the like. There, it is uh, a description of them in their moral qualities. You know, as in Acts 6, he tells them to set, up, set aside seven men, good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. And there's a, a longer list of the qualifications in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3. You know, dignity, not double tongue, not addicted to wine, not fond of sordid gain, etc., etc. They're moral, so it, it's a spiritual office. Uh, though they're going to be often dealing with physical needs. Notice that. And then secondly, notice that in both passages, the office of deacon or the role of deacon is placed in relation to a higher office. So in the case of Acts 6, there are apostles. Apostles are about their peculiar ministry. And then there are these practical needs that must be met. And they said, notice they use the same word. You don't hear it as the same word because we, we easily miss it. But they tell... Uh, the congregation in verse 2 of Acts 6 it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables that's diaconia uh, but we will devote verse 4 but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry diaconia the, the ministry of the word so the, the apostles have a service that they're supposed to be about. And they need somebody else to take care of this other service that they can be about. And then that is echoed in the parallel between elders and deacons in 1 Timothy 3. The point is this. They're all actually working toward the same end, which is the support of the church. Deacons are not assistants to the elders. That is, they're not supposed to take care of the elders. They're supposed to help the elders take care of the church. The whole business is about service to the church, about sustaining the church. And so these, these men that are set aside are set aside for the support of the church. Whether it is in, uh, uh, well, we say as they meet certain kinds of needs, it frees the uh, other officers to be about their work as well, but it's all working in the same direction. So firstly, the deacons, just like the original word was about caring for, taking care of, supporting, sometimes translated as administering, all kinds of lesser translations, but it's about keeping things going, taking care of, so now the deacons come in to support the church. Secondly, Deacons are an expression. They are an expression of the church. And this is what I mean by this. If you survey the word group of which diakonos is a part, those three words, servant, service, serving, minister, ministry, ministry, ministering, look at all the verses where those words are employed. You'll discover that this idea of service Diaconia, it permeates the church from the top to the bottom. 
everyone, everyone is about this. From when I say from the top, I mean the very top, as in Jesus Christ defines himself and defines his church this way. Uh, when his disciples are squabbling over who's greatest, uh, he says to them in Matthew 20, you know in verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, diaconos. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, the verb, but to serve, the verb, and to give his life a ransom for many. So he, he, he defines his own foundational work for the church in the language of diaconos, or diaconi. And then he says, essentially to us, now you guys need to be like me. You need to be like this. It starts at the top and then it goes on down. Everybody is described in this language. So Peter says of the prophets, he says of the Old Testament prophets in, I don't remember where, 1 Peter 1, I think, that they were not serving themselves when they wrote the books. They were serving us. The prophets were serving us. And of course, we've already covered it. The apostles through and through describe their work with minister, ministering, ministry, same words. And then when they uh, push this work off to the next generation, you know, in Timothy and, and the like, uh, Timothy is encouraged, and Timothy, in a sense, stands for all of us, uh, all of those of us who are preachers and the like, it would be lovely if I could just lay my eyes on the verse, but he tells him to, there it is, there we go, verse 5 of chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, 5. So this is Paul's last letter, and he's speaking to Timothy, and so we should understand Timothy as an individual, but Timothy is also the first long list of ministers, evangelists, Preachers, teachers, and he says to him, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, your diaconia, fulfill your ministry. And But it doesn't end with the preachers and the teachers and the evangelists and the elders. It's everyone. So Peter says in 1 Peter 4, he says to the whole church, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Now the point isn't that everybody's a deacon in the sense of the office. Everybody isn't a deacon in that way. The point is this. The deacons are an expression of what the whole church is supposed to be about. All of us are to be servants. I don't just mean occasionally. Jesus defines himself as the one who came to serve. And he says, if you want to be anything in my kingdom, then you need to be like me in that regard. And so the deacons, when we set them aside for peculiar work, we are setting them aside, not as somebody to take, you know, you take this job away from us, but as an expression of who and what we are as the body of Christ. There's your etymology. You can all relax now. No more funny words. Secondly, uh, briefly, exhortation. Exhortation. I'm supposed to give an exhortation to the man. By that, I understand all the deacons and to the congregation. So I thought I would do it that way. I would speak to the deacons and to the congregation. So my exhortation to the deacons is to serve the church. How's that? It's 
deep inside I have, serve the church you have, you are, continue, do not grow weary in doing good, Sam joined them in these things, serve the church, do things, do things, do physical things, do practical things, do merciful things, do spiritual things according to the need at hand, whether it is uh, uh, loading the truck or administering something that needs administering around here, or speaking a word. I mean, look at those deacons. Look at look at Stephen. You're not just maintenance men. Serve the church according to your opportunities and your abilities. That's the first thing I would say to you. And then the second thing I would say to you is that you should lead us, the rest of the church, in service. Now, I, I was struck as I was um, getting ready uh, for this service and going over what our little book says, all the things it says that I'm supposed to do. And it, uh, it gives me, you know, an example of how I might describe the warrant of the office of deacon. And in the course of it's a couple of paragraphs. And one of the paragraphs describes the duties of deacons. And I, was, I thought this was very interesting. It says, the duties of deacons consists of encouraging members of the church to provide for those who are in want, seeking to prevent poverty, making discreet and cheerful distribution to the needy, praying with the distressed and reminding them of the consolations of Holy Scripture. I thought it interesting that it starts with the duties of deacons consist of encouraging members of the church. You, you can read that narrowly. All they're supposed to do is encourage members of the church to provide, and then the rest of the stuff is for them to do. But that's crazy talk. Diakonos, diakonia, permeates the church. We have said that in our judgment, we hope, led by the Spirit, that these men are peculiarly gifted for being deacons. And I would say to those deacons, then you ought to encourage us in this virtue, this defining characteristic of the church. You should encourage us, you should lead us by your example, by your exhortation, by your attitude in the service. You should lead us. You should model for us. Maybe occasionally give us a comfortable swift kick in the posterior towards service. Uh, but you can only do that if you yourselves are doing it. As you have been, I would encourage you to continue to do so. Then, secondly, I would give an exhortation to the congregation, which is this. Be led. Be led by them as they would lead us in this. Christ has said that the spirit or the ethos of his church is service, being a humble servant of putting yourself lower, not higher. I, I imagine when he said those words that I read earlier, that I am amongst you as a servant. Some were God's friend. Many have they, they just can't imagine that this is the nature of the kingdom, that we put ourselves in. Well, the deacons are called to emulate and model and exemplify that. And I'm telling them they ought to lead us in it. And I'm telling you, including myself, that we ought to be led into this game. As they serve, we ought to serve with them. Now, I can say to you two things. Uh, one, I can say joyfully, 20 something years here. We have a lot of volunteers. We have a lot of people that serve. We have always had people that serve. And that has always been a great delight to me. I can also say to you a little less joyfully that recently, very recently, within the past uh, weeks, uh, some of us were, some of the officers were saying, we're still getting help, but we're not getting the help that we once got. That, uh, in some sense, there has been a, a little shift in our congregation from very high volunteerism to a little bit lower volunteerism. There's always, there are always those people who will always do whatever you want 
even if they shouldn't. I think if I needed to move a grand piano, Dottie Tippett and Diana Coppice would say, we got it, you know? <laughs> there are always those who do. Uh, but let me encourage you, I'm with, you know, uh, if you think it's uncomfortable, stand here and say these things. Uh, but let me take opportunity in God's providence by the raising up of a deacon and setting before us an opportunity to give exhortation. Let me just say, now would be the day to ask yourself, not today, but going forward, maybe, maybe I should be a little bit more open in my ears when there are calls for volunteers. There's calls for volunteers all the time. And maybe I should find things that I can do if I'm not doing. Uh, maybe I should ask, <laughs> is there something I can do? Depending on who you are, there are things that I would tell you. Uh, I, there are things that I think should be done that if some of you asked me, I wouldn't tell you to do them because they wouldn't fit you. But there are things, and I imagine the deeds. So just ask yourself. Uh, I know we all want to get out of this basement and we want the church to grow and all like that. Um, let us manifest the life of Christ. That is very attractive. That's very attractive to others. And see if he does not open for us more opportunities. It's, a, it's an excellent opportunity tonight. Where am I? If the world is divided between those who recline at table and those who serve, which am I? Which am I? Amen? Let us pray together. Great, mighty God, we do ask your blessing upon our church and in peculiar or particular tonight on our deacons and most especially for Sam. Uh, I pray that he would uh, take up with these men work. I hope that they, the, the mats, our other two deacons are encouraged by the addition uh, and I hope that just as January 1st is just another day, but we use it as an opportunity to start afresh in old duties, I pray that this might be a, a nice little starting point, not just for those three, but for the whole church. Uh, a little more energy, a little more focus, a little more serving, a little less reclining. Uh, I do give thanks, Father that we are not a lazy group. We haven't had a bunch of self-indulgence or selfishness, but we can always rise a little higher and run a little faster, work a little harder, and bear a little more fruit. And so I ask that by your spirit, we be about these things. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.